Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much tonight for the study of your word. Thank you because it's the strength and the backbone of the believer. And it is the very foundation of the church. Because the church is built on the truth. The church being the ground and the pillar of truth. We are praying, O oh Lord, as we come every day, st studying your word. We pray, O oh Lord, you strengthen our Christian lives in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, as many as are just coming, and as many as are just getting saved, you get them into the habit of joyfully, cheerfully studying your word, so they can be strong in the grace of the Lord in Jesus' name. And for those of us who have been here for some time, we pray, Lord, we'll never lose the joy and the interest and the desire, the delight of studying your word in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, as the world is running to a close and the Lord is about to come, and you say that men at the time of the coming of the Lord will be running to and fro, seeking the word of God, but they will not find it because there will be a famine of the world. We pray that at such a time, the hunger for your word, the desire for your word, the delight in your word, the relishing of your word, you grant unto every one of us in Jesus' name. And as we come today, Lord, we pray that your spirit will take the words we're studying, apply it to every heart, and strengthen us in the word and in the Lord in Jesus' name. Bless your people, Lord. Bless all the people that are here today and all that were here as they hear through the cassette. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. What a joy once again to come to the presence of the Lord as we study the Word of God. The church here is committed to studying the Word of God verse by verse. And when we take a book of Scripture, we go from chapter to chapter, from verse to verse, and we try to dig deep into the Word of God, because it's in that. We find the great minds and the great riches and treasure in the Word of God as we dig deep into the Word of God. From the very beginning of the church, when we were just deep alive, deep Christian life ministry, we made it a point of regularly, weekly studying the Word of God, to dig deep into the Word of the Lord. At this very time now, we're in the epistle of James. And we're now in chapter 5, the last chapter of uh, the epistle. And today we're looking at just one verse of Scripture. You'll find it in verse 12. Please open your Bible with me. James chapter 5, verse 12. But above all things, my brethren, Swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your ye be ye, that means let your yes be yes. And your nay, nay, that means, and your no, no. Lest ye fall into condemnation. That's the important scripture we're studying tonight. The Spirit of God actually has given us many practical lessons and instructions in the epistle of James. Here the ministry of the Holy Spirit is leading us into all truth. You find as you study verse by verse and you look at the various sections of the word you are studying. There are many, many practical things a child of God actually needs in his life. And what we're looking at today, it looks peculiar to James and to Jesus. You'll find that James was in perfect agreement with the Lord Jesus Christ when Jesus was in his earthly ministry. Have you seen what uh, James said there? He's talking about swearing, something that many, many people do in common, regular activities of life, as well as in serious matters, what they do in the open place and what they do in the court places. Look at what Jesus said about it in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, and again, Ye have heard that it has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, here comes the authoritative word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in the new covenant, he's telling us the old covenant is going and it will soon be gone at that time. 
and then the new covenant will come. Under the old covenant, you have been told, you, could, you must not forswear thyself. You will perform the oath unto the Lord. But now, under the new covenant, I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, yes, yes, nay, nay, no, no. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. And so, number one thing we learn here is that if you're a real preacher of the gospel like James was, you'll be in perfect agreement with the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church and the foundation of all truth. If you are a real Christian too, and you say you are filled with the Holy Spirit, learn something. The Holy Spirit will never contradict the scripture of truth. Therefore, whoever takes anything or says anything or acts anyhow, and he says, I'm being led of the Spirit of God. If that thing the fellow is doing or saying, teaching or instructing or counseling, is contrary to the scripture, to the word of truth, we know that cannot be of God. Because the Spirit and the scripture must always agree. In Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Let's understand then, as we attribute many, many things we say, and many, many things we teach to the Holy Spirit, if that thing does not tally, does not agree with the scripture, it cannot be of the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God in James was in perfect agreement with what Jesus Christ had taught in the earthly ministry. In John chapter 14, verse 26. John 14, 26, by the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Do you see very clearly in the passage we are looking at today? How the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, brought into James' remembrance what Jesus Christ has taught. And so we should have the same attitude when you are walking according to the truth. And you are actually talking by the Spirit of the truth. Then the Spirit of God will bring you to the truth that Jesus Christ had already taught in his earthly ministry. James chapter 5 verse 12. This verse we are looking at today deals with the subject of swearing. In the Old Testament, the children of Israel were permitted to swear whenever they were confirming an oath or an agreement or a solemn transaction. They were permitted, they could call the name of God to witness their word that it was absolutely true. But in the New Covenant, the New Covenant teaches that we're living by higher principle, higher spiritual principle. And believers in Christ are not to swear at all. But we are just to speak the truth and to affirm that we will only speak the truth and nothing but the truth. We're looking at the subject, the teaching today, on a three subtitles. Number one, the command against swearing. The command against swearing. Number two, conversation without swearing. Conversation without swearing. And then number three, condemnation for swearing. Number one, the command against swearing. Let's come back to James chapter 5. In James chapter 5, verse 12, but above all things, it says you've been learning quite a lot of things from chapter 1. It's been telling us about the spiritual life, the practical life, the righteous life of the child of God. And over many times, he addresses it to the church. He addresses it to the people that are members of the family of God. It says, my brethren, and it says it here again in verse 12, but above all things, my brethren, and above all things that you have heard, 
above all things you have read, above all things you have heard, as you have gone through the epistle, my brethren, children of God, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yes be yes, let your no be no, lest ye fall into, the, into condemnation. Here we have the command of the Lord against swearing. By the way, we need to ask a question. Why do people of the world swear? Why is swearing so common in society? The reason is because lying is so prevalent in the society. And men generally will impose oath-taking or swearing on other people in an attempt to force them to be truthful and to keep their promises. They feel that these people will not keep their promise except they lay an oath upon them. That's why you'll find some young people, they want to promise themselves that they are going to get married eventually. They don't know the Lord and they do not trust one another. And they feel that he is not going to stand by the word, she is not going to stand by the promise, and therefore they want to swear. And they may even go beyond and cut themselves and mix their blocks together and leak their blood so that they can get into an oath. That's why you find business people, they want to uh, kind of uh, employ somebody. And then because they do not trust, they do not believe that they are going to be truthful to one another. Therefore, they are going to compel them to swear one way or the other. That's why you find when people are being put into an office in any community, the society will want to compel them to swear because they do not believe they are going to stand by their word. They do not believe they are going to stand by their manifesto. And because they do not believe them, the only way they can compel them uh, to do something that will be similar to the truth is to swear. In fact, uh, it's not a new thing. Uh, there's a thing that we're saying about the society, that the society in the street, in the courtroom, everywhere you find people, there is lying, there is deception. In fact, in Psalm 116, Psalm 116, verse 11. I said in my ears, all men are liars. The psalmist came to the conclusion. He said, I even forgot that some people are born again. I forgot some people are children of God. I even forgot I could still trust some few people in my haste. When I forgot that there were some few people that were righteous, I said, all men are liars. Why did you say that? Because lying, deception, fraud, cheating was so common in society. That's the very reason why people compel one another. If you promise them something, if you say, can you do this? Are you going to do this? And say, yes, I'm going to do that. They say, I don't accept. I don't take your word. I don't believe that you are telling me the truth. And then they want to lay an oath is swearing upon the people because of the corrupt condition of the world. In Jeremiah chapter 7, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 28, But thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeyeth not the voice of the Lord their God, and receiveth not correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. You see that condition? That's the condition of the world. Truth is perished. And because there is no truth anywhere, that's why uh, swearing is so common and so prevalent in, in Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 3, they bench their tongues like their bow for lies. But they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. For they proceed from evil to evil. And they know not me, says the Lord. Because of many unconverted people, they do not know the Lord. Because of that line is so common. And everybody knows. They don't, they don't tell truth to other people. And they don't expect anybody to tell them truth. Therefore, they lay the swearing on them. In verse 5 it says, and they will deceive everyone his neighbor. And will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. And weary themselves to commit iniquity. That's the condition of the world in which we live. It was a condition of the world in which they were living at that time. In Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. Reading from verse 14. See this. And the judgment is turned away backward. And the justice standeth afar off. 
for truth is falling in the street and equity cannot enter. You see that? Truth is falling in the street. That's why you'll find almost anywhere you go, there is dishonesty everywhere. There is deceit everywhere. There is lying everywhere. Children, that is sinful children, lie to their parents. Parents, that is unconverted parents, lie to their children. Unsaved husbands lie to their wives. Unconverted wives lie to their husbands. And unregenerated employees lie, lie to their employers. And wicked employers, in turn, they lie to their employees. Look around you, in the whole of society, where don't we find lies? Educators lie, scientists lie, politicians lie, members of the media lie, people in government lie. Knowing that we live in a world of lies, society tries to compel people to make their promises under serious, solemn oaths by swearing. And even after swearing, they do not always keep their word today. No, they cannot. Or regenerate humanity as children of the father of lies cannot speak the truth because the truth is not in them and they cannot hold on to the truth. That's exactly what Jesus said. As we look at John chapter 8, John chapter 8, looking at it in verse 44, John 8 verse 44, Ye of your father the devil, Jesus was telling the religious uh, Jews, the people that ought to have known better, and the people that ought to have the truth in them. Do you see why even those Jews, Old Testament people, Old Covenant people, do you see why they were still swearing? They too, they were, they were liars. It says, and the loss of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. So then you understand why the people were swearing. Because of the condition of the world and because of the things, uh, you know, they, they wanted to get from one another. Uh, you say that was Bible time. Will it, will it be any way, any way better in, at the end of the age, at the close of the age, when the coming of the Lord is near? Will it be better at all? Let's, let's see the answer from the Bible in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 1. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, see now the time in which we are living, and near the coming of the Lord. In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of the devils. Look at verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, that's why, even till the end of the age and till the end of the world, lying will still be there. Deception will still be there. Hypocrisy will still be there. And therefore, swearing will still be there among the people of the world. But now let's come back to the people who are children of God. Such oath-taking and swearing is unnecessary for real born-again Christians. Why? Because we are born again by the Lord Jesus Christ and He is the truth. Because we are reading the word of God and we are controlled by the word of God and that is the truth. Why? Because God desires truth in the inward man. Our speech always then should be truthful and honest and our lives must always demonstrate integrity and credibility because we are the children of God. Before conversion, you find people, uh, they, they swear. You find children, uh, they will touch the uh, ground and touch their tongue and point to heaven. And then they will say to God who made them. And then what they say after that, everything is a lie. And then you find people in the neighborhood, something has been stolen. And then they say, who stole this thing? And the fellow that stole the thing will be lamenting and mourning and regretting and even raining curses on the person that stole that thing. And they will be swearing heaven and earth if he knew the whereabouts of that thing. And then the people say, we're going to swear the person that has taken the thing. And if they are churchgoers, they take the Bible. If they are not churchgoers, they take another book. Or they take iron. Or they take whatever they want to take as a symbol of the judgment that will come upon the person that took the thing. 
And lo and behold, the fellow that stole the scene will all also swear. In fact, he'll be so dramatic and dynamic in his swearing. Everybody will say he cannot be the person. The way this fellow is swearing, he cannot be the person. And then the fellow that swears in a gentle way, they say this is the fellow. And then you find that in the world in which we live, because there is no truth, that's why the people are swearing. And they swear quite by a lot of things in Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, reading from verse 16, one to you. Ye blind guys, Jesus was talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple is nothing. That's what they were saying. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor, ye fools and blind. For whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. And whosoever they said shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift, that is upon it, he is guilty, ye fools and blind. For whether, which one is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Whosoever therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God. And and by him, that's God Almighty, that seated thereon. That is a warning to every true child of God. We have nothing to do with swearing. In fact, the word of God has commanded us both in Matthew and in James that we should not swear at all. Didn't you notice how James started the verse that we're studying today? But above all, beyond all, whatever it is you have done before, and whatever it is other people are doing around you, he was making the teaching and the command in the verse very important, very necessary for those who profess to follow Christ, for those who are children of God. Even though the Jewish system, the old covenant, permitted oaths and swearing. By the name of the Lord, it was only on weighty things at that time, solemn things at that time, and truthful matters at that time. It was not allowed even for flimsy things, but in the New Testament, it is not allowed at all. We are no more to swear by any name, by anything. That's why we read there in James, it says, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. And Jesus was very emphatic as he, for, as he was forbidding a uh, swearing uh, for his disciples. Even in the law court, if a Christian goes to the court today and you are told to swear, you say, no, I'm a Christian. I believe the Bible. I'm going to tell the truth, only the truth. What I will do is I will affirm my word, that my word is true, and my word you'll find to be true. And the law court, the law of the land, allows the believer to affirm his word if he does not want to swear. And we should not take uh, the name of the Lord lightly. And we should not uh, just mention the name of the Lord in our ordinary conversations. Uh, they are searching for a mountain thing, a material thing, a, a little thing. Or it is in the area of a relationship between you and another fellow. And then you drag the name of God. And you drag the name of holy things and holy materials. We don't do that. We shouldn't that, do that as Christians. In Exodus chapter 20 verse 7. Exodus chapter 20 verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold them guiltless that taketh his name in vain. In Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 12. Leviticus 19 verse 12. It says, And ye shall not swear by my name falsely. Neither shall thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. And then in Psalm 89, Psalm 89, verse 7. Here we are told and we are told the kind of honor, the kind of respect, we ought, the kind of reverence we ought to have for God. And the name of God should be so sacred, the name of God should be so honorable, that we will not take the name of the Lord in vain. In uh, Psalm 89, verse 7. 
God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints, and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. And as you, as you look at that, as you meditate on that, and as you obey that, you will cut off swearing from your language completely, whether at home, or in the place of work, or in the court, or in any situation and in any place, there will be no swearing at all. You will obey the commandments of the Lord, which we have read and which we are studying today in James chapter 5, verse 12, where it says, But above all, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. All oaths and different kinds of swearing were refused by the early church as we read church history. And that went on for several centuries. An oath is unnecessary for a child of God because a child of God is committed to the truth. Not only that, he knows that all liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. A person that knows that if he tells a lie, that the judgment will be held fire, why will he tell a lie? He knows the truth of the word of God. He knows the, the consequence of telling lies is very great. You don't need to lay an oath or you don't need to lay swearing upon him before he tells you the truth. In any case, a New Testament believer knows that if he tells a lie, uh, if he wants to get to heaven, eventually he will make restitution. And when he knows that he's still going to make restitution, either he intentionally tells a lie, or unintentionally or knowingly tells a lie, he will still make restitution. Why do you think that such an individual will want to tell a lie? No, he will not want to tell a lie. He knows the truth. He knows the word of God. And because of the word of God that controls him, there will be no lying, there will be no deception. In Revelation chapter 21 verse 8, Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving, and the abominable and murderers, and the allmongers and the sorcerers, and the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake with burning with fire and brimstone. Because the believer knows that there is no reason for him to tell a lie, and there is no reason for him to swear. He will tell the truth in any case, because he is following Jesus Christ, who is the way and the life and the truth. We go to point number two. Conversation without swearing. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing? And wouldn't we be living in a clean society, morally clean society, when uh, we do not have to swear, when what you hear, there is a yes and there is a confirmation. You give the yes in promise and then you give the yes in performance. Or you give the no in promise and then you give the no in performance. Your yes is yes and your no is no. We come back to James chapter 5 in the middle of verse, uh, of verse 12. It says, but let your ye be ye and your nay nay. It says, in your conversation, as you interact one with the other, here is the way you are going to be conversing. You will make sure you think before you speak, and you will make sure you don't just jump into a conversation. You are very thoughtful, and because you are very thoughtful, the things you say will be found to be the truth. You will not be a person that will say something, and then you will, people will find out that it wasn't the truth. Eventually, conversation without swearing, conversation without lying, conversation without deception. In Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 37, it says, But let your communication be yea, yea. That is, let your conversation be as you discuss, relate with one another. Let it be yes, yes, simply, or no, no, simply. For whatsoever is more than these is, is coming of evil. It cometh of evil. And therefore you find that if we're children of God, that we're going to stick to the truth. We're going to live by the truth. And we will not have to be going about uh, swearing to confirm our word. This is what we learned from the early Christians. And this is an example that Paul, the apostle himself, that he gave us. Look at Second Corinthians chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. When I therefore was thus minded, did I use likeness? Or the things that I purpose? 
do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? He said, did you find indecision in what I was telling you? Did you find a vacillation in what I was telling you? Did you find a yes and no, a no and yes? Did you find undecided attitude in what I was telling you, changing like a chameleon in what I told you in verse 18? But as God is true, a word toward you was not yea and nay for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me, and Silvanus, the silence, and uh, Timotheus, the Timothy, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. It tells us that uh, because we're children of God, uh, they were speaking the truth, and they were standing by what they were saying. That's how you characterize a child of God. That's how you characterize a minister of the gospel. They say something, and without swearing, because they are following Christ the truth, they are able to stand by the word of truth. Of course, we know on the other side that Satan is a liar, and a father of lies. And all his children, whether they are sinners, raw sinners, or they are backsliders, have a, have a kind of a big, a big uh, sinners. They live and transact business by lies and deception. But when you come to the church, when you come to Christ, when you are washed in the blood of the Lamb, and you are following after Christ, Christ Jesus is the truth. And all his followers have believed the truth. Not only that, they have been saved by the truth. Not only that, they have been transformed by the truth. Not only that, they have been delivered and set free by the truth. They rejoice in the truth. And because of that, every child of God, a real bona fide child of God, a real genuine child of God, a person that is a child of God through and through, within and without, in the house and in the church and everywhere, he will speak the truth and he will do all things honestly and in the truth. And I want you to please have that in your mind, the characteristic of a child of God. The, the, the attribute of a real child of God. Somebody who is born again. Somebody who is a child of God. Somebody whose life, whose life has been transformed. Truth within. Truth without. Truth in the mouth. Truth on his lips. Truth in his action. Truth in his attitude. Truth every time. And truth everywhere. Look at that in the word of God. In Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Verse 30, Psalm 119, verse 30, I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. That's a real child of God. You find a child of God is a person that has made a deliberate choice. He said, I've been living the way of deception before. I've been living in lies before. I've been a great, big hypocrite before. But now I've discovered myself. And I've come to the Lord now. I've heard the truth of the word of God. I choose that way of truth. And when he chooses that way of truth, it means he wants to live by that truth. But that truth does something in him. In James chapter 1, James chapter 1, verse 18. Of his own will begat he us by the word of truth. That's how he became born again. He became saved by the truth. Regenerated by the truth. Because of the truth of the gospel that entered into him, he became born again. Begotten by the truth. Not only that, in uh, John chapter 8 verse 32. John chapter 8 verse 32. And ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Do you understand the life of the Christian now? Number one, he has chosen the way of truth. Number two, is born again, is begotten by the truth of the word of God. Number three, is set free and is delivered by the truth. He shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. In John chapter 17, verse 17, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. This person that we are calling a Christian, a real child of God, no, he doesn't need to swear. No, he doesn't need to confirm his word by an oath. He has chosen the way of truth. He is begotten by the truth. He is set free by the truth. He is even sanctified 
by the truth. And this man we're talking about, the only thing that causes him joy is when he is finding truth around, the, around him, the people that live around him, and he himself too, when there is truth within and without. That causes him joy. He rejoices in the truth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. That's the one we call a Christian. And because he's a Christian born again, sanctified by the truth, and he's studying the word of truth, the scripture of truth, and he's, uh, he's controlled, he's filled and saturated with the word of truth, everything he says, everything he speaks, and the way he acts will be by the way of truth. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up unto, into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Do you see now the characteristic of a real child of God? Because it's truth within and truth without, truth around and truth everywhere. That's why he doesn't need to swear. That's why Jesus Christ said, you are following the truth. You have been born again. You are now in the new covenant, and you are following Christ. That is the very personification of the truth. Then let your communication be yes, yes, or no, no. When you say no, mean it and stand by it. When you say yes, mean it and stand by it. And James also said the same thing in perfect agreement with Christ. James also said, but let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. Both Christ and James, by the Holy Spirit, call for straightforwardness and honesty and truth in our speech. True Christians are not those whose yes are those whose yes will mean yes. True Christians are the people whose no will mean no. They are people of truth and integrity. And they have no need to swear or to convince others of their truthfulness. Speaking the truth in every situation will cause the believer to shine as light. In the darkness of a world of lies, his communication will be yes when he gives a promise, and then he'll follow it up with a yes and an amen affirmation in the performance. Uh, look at the scriptures and see what the Lord is telling us, how we ought to live by the truth and walk by the truth and do everything in the truth. In Colossians chapter 4, Colossians chapter 4, Reading there from verse 6. Let your, let your speech be always with grace. You know, when grace is there, you will not see any disgraceful sin. You will not see any ungracious sin. Let your speech be always with grace. And you know that grace always goes with truth. Because the Bible says that Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. And so you are a believer, you are a child of God, you have received the grace of God, and the grace of God is reigning within you. Then your life will demonstrate the grace and the truth. Season will solve, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. In Ephesians chapter 4, let's go back to that chapter. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 25. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Wherefore, put in a way lying. Put it away completely. Let everybody find, whenever you say anything, if they check out six months after, one year after, five years after, let them find, it is so absolutely. Wherefore, put it away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Don't tell your children something not true. Don't tell your parents, you young people, something which is not true. Don't tell your wife, don't tell your husband something which is false. Make sure you speak the truth one to the other. In verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of a defying that it may minister grace to the hearers. That's the watch of God. In fact, uh, the Bible tells us if we aim to get to heaven at last. This uh, thing we're talking about is very, very important in Psalm 15. Psalm 15, verse 1 and verse 2. If we want to make heaven our home at last, 
And if we want uh, the Lord to say, he knows us, we are the beloved of the Lord. We are the children of God. And we'll be on his right hand side on that final day of the great separation and the great beyond. Then we must be men of truth and women of truth. See how the scripture says it. In Psalm 15, reading from verse 1. David was asking the question, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall stand in his holy hill? Even though David was a king, even though he had a lot of things here on earth, he wanted to know who will be able to get to heaven at last. And whatever we have on earth, I'm sure you understand now that the time we spend on earth is like a hand's breath. It's like a shadow. It's like the vapor that appears now and vanishes away very, very soon. Because life is very short at the best. It's on the other side. We're going to live in eternity. And therefore, if you want to reign with Christ, if you want to be in that final abode, if you want to be in paradise in heaven at last, where are you going to spend eternity if there is no truth in you? David was asking the question, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? I'm interested. I want to know. I want to be a candidate for heaven. Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Look at the answer coming from God himself. He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. That's a real Christian. That's the one that is going to get to heaven at last. That's the one that uh, Jesus has gone to prepare heaven for. The people that speak the truth. The people that their yes is yes, their no is no. And what uh, you hear of them is just that they are truthful. They are men that are uh, of accountability, of integrity. You can depend upon them. You can lean upon them. They will never deceive you. You don't need to bind them. You don't need to force them to swear because... Whether the swearing is there or swearing is not there, they are going to tell you the absolute truth. Even when they have made a mistake and they have done something they shouldn't have done, they know that covering it up with a lie is adding sin to sin. They are still going to tell you the truth in any case. In Psalm 51, Psalm 51, reading from verse 6, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward part. God desires truth in the inward part and in the hidden part. Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. That's why James has been talking about the, um, the, uh, the, the uselessness of uh, swearing. It says it's not necessary. We're now in the light. We're now in the kingdom. And because we're now in the kingdom, we're in the truth. And the people that are going to tell the truth, even if you are going to kill them, they're going to be faithful unto that truth, even until death. You don't need to bind them by an oath. Come back to James, please. Chapter 5 and verse 12. It says, now because the light has come. And because we are following the truth. And because we are children of God. Because we are brethren. And as brethren, we are going to speak the truth one to the other to our neighbors. It says, but above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. That means, maybe there is a, a, a particular kind of oath I didn't mention in the message. That's it. That place covers it. It says the one that is mentioned or by any other oath. It means you'll not swear at all in any situation, in any circumstance, by any kind of oath, whether it's a village type or it's a city type or it's educated type, any kind of oath, swear not at all. But let your yes be yes, let your no be no. Then the latter part, lest ye fall into condemnation. That leads us to point three now. Condemnation for swearing. It says, don't swear. Because if you swear, you will come into condemnation. The warning against swearing is not without great and grave consequence. For those who disobey and violate the word of God. Those who disregard the warning and keep on swearing will definitely and eventually fall into condemnation. Such people that swear will be punished because of their disobedience against the word of God. They will be punished how? They will be punished severely. The wrath of God and the judgment of God will come upon them because they are disobedient to the word of the Lord. 
in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, those who swore falsely, or took the name of God in vain, and those who called God to witness and affirm a lie, they were punished severely. And even unto death, in those Old Testament times, those who swore falsely, or swore by false strange gods, were mercilessly condemned and sentenced to hell, sentenced to death, and eventually to hell. This is what James is referring to when he warns us and he says, don't swear at all, because if you swear, you will fall into condemnation, the condemnation of the disobedient, the condemnation of the laws. Let's look at the scriptures to confirm what we're seeing in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, reading there from verse 5. It says, I will come near to you to judgment. I will be a swift, quick witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against the false wearers. Now, wait for a minute. You see the group here, and you see the group and the company that the people in the Old Testament that swore falsely, or they swore by false gods, the group they came to, they were treated the same way the adulterers were treated. They were treated the same way witches and wizards, sorcerers were treated. The false wearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages. That's what we studied uh, two weeks ago. The people that oppress their employees and they don't pay them what they ought to pay them. And the widow, they oppress the widow and they oppress the fatherless that turn aside the stranger from the right. And fear me not, says the Lord. If immediately God said that, when he said, I'll bring judgment upon the people that are sworn in falsely, he said, for I am God, I change not. He's still as ruthless today, as serious today, against liars, against the people that are uh, perpetrating deception, as he ever was. Because in his judgment, he is God, he changes not. I said that uh, when people swore falsely in the Old Testament, or they called uh, the name of God to a flimsy thing, a worthless thing, an unessential thing, a great uh, judgment came upon them. Let's look at an example in Leviticus chapter 24. Leviticus chapter 24, reading there from verse 10. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 10. And the son of an Israelite woman, the, whose father was an Egyptian. That's a problem of mixed marriages. That's a problem of an equal yoke. Uh, the father, an Egyptian, and the mother, an Israelite woman, went out among the children of Israel. And this son of the Israelite woman and the man of Israel strove together in the camp. And the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed that is swearing and cursing that is saying, let this happen to me if it were not this and this by the name of the God of Israel. That was a cursing. And they brought him unto Moses. And his mother's name was Shelomis, and the daughter of Debri, of the tribe of Dan. And then it says, and they put him in war, they put him in custody, that the might, that the, that the might of the Lord might be shown them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring forth him that has cursed, that has sworn by my name, that has taken my name uh, lightly, and has blasphemed by my name. Without the camp, bring him outside the camp. And let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head, and let all the congregation stone him, and I shall speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curses is God, blasphemes is God, dishonors is God, shall bear his sin. And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall certainly stone him, as well the stranger as he that is born in the land. When he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, shall, put, shall be put to death. You see, it was a serious sin. At that time, until the very end of the Old Testament, it was as serious as that. That's why I read it to you in Malachi, in Sephaniah. Sephaniah, very near the end of the um, Old Testament. Sephaniah chapter 1. In Sephaniah chapter 1, 
uh, we learn uh, still in the word of God. Reading from verse 2. Here the word of God is seen very clearly. Sephaniah, are you there? It's before Haggai. It says in chapter 1 verse 2, I will utterly consume all things from off the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of heaven and the fishes of the sea and the, stum and the stumbling blocks with the wicked. I will cut off man from off the land, says the Lord. I will also stretch out my hand upon Judah and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off the remnant of Baal from, the, from this place and the name of uh, Shemarims uh, from uh, with the priests and them that worship the host of heaven upon the house tops and them that worship and that swear by the Lord and that swear by Malcolm. Do you see that? He, 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 he lines them up. He tells all the categories of the people that the judgment will come upon. And he says, he will be sweet in, swift in judgment against them. And then he says, he is going to now bring the judgment against the people that are worshipping the host of heaven upon the house doors. And then upon the people that are swearing by the name of the Lord, he is going to bring the judgment upon them. Then in verse 6, it says them that are turned back from the Lord, the backsliders, the people that are no more worshipping God in acceptable manner, and those that have not sought the Lord, nor inquired by for him. And therefore you understand that God is still very serious about uh, this matter of uh, swearing in Zechariah chapter 5. Zechariah chapter 5, reading from verses 3 and 4. Then said ye unto me, This is a curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. You understand? It's not a local sin. It's not only for the children of Israel. It's not only the territory of the people of Judah alone. The curse, the judgment, the wrath of God now, it goes forth over the whole, the face of the whole earth. And then it says, For everyone that stealeth shall be cut off on this side according to it. And everyone that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side according to it. The one that steals and the one that swears. Maybe you say, thank God, I'm not uh, stealing. But are you swearing? The judgment of God is upon the people that are swearing to him. Verse 4, I will bring it forth, says the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the sea, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of his house, and shall consume it for with the timber thereof, and the stones thereof. Therefore you find that the Lord himself is saying that he will bring a judgment. And he will bring judgment upon the people that are sworn in. In the Old Testament, if they swore falsely, the judgment came upon them. But now the standard is higher. We're not allowed. We're not expected. We're not permitted to swear at all. So in the New Testament, if anyone is sworn now, he will be under the judgment of God. In Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23, reading from verse 10. It says, For the land is full of adulterers. For because of swearing, the land mourneth. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up, and their curse is evil, and their force is not right. For both the prophet and the priest are profane. Yea, in my house have I found their wickedness, says the Lord. Wherefore, their way shall be unto them as slippery ways in darkness. They shall be driven on, and they shall fall therein. For I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, says the Lord. You will see what we have studied today. That uh, the word of God is very, very clear. And uh, we're taking the time necessary to make it very clear that we who are children of God today, we have nothing to do with swearing at all. We are men of truth. We are women of truth. We are young people of truth. We have known the Lord and we are following the Lord. And we are going to cut off every form of swearing from our mouth. And from now, we are going to say the truth. I said we are going to say the truth. 
We're going to stand by the truth. Anywhere we are, we'll declare the truth in Jesus' name. The Lord wants me to remind you, brothers and sisters, above all things, swear not at all. Neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yes be yes. Be a truthful man, a truthful woman, a truthful young person. Let your no be no, lest ye come into condemnation. I pray you will not come into condemnation. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, hell, all that we have done wrongly, in, in a swearing, common swearing, or swearing because something was lost, or swearing by the Bible, or swearing by the name of God, or swearing in the school, or swearing at home, or swearing in the family, or swearing between young people wanting to get married, any form of swearing or oath taking. Let's talk to the Lord. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, cleanse us. Change our language. We will not swear anymore. And we will be people of truth. We will live by the truth. We will stand by the truth. We will declare the truth every time. Speaking the truth to one another in love. Let the truth of the Lord be found in your mouth every time. 